almost noon, folks. Thank you for tuning in for another one of our Cosmic Conversations. My name is Josh Roberts. I'm one of the planetarium staff at the Morrison Planetarium, California Academy of Sciences, and we are here today with someone I am very excited to introduce to you. This is Dr. Pascal Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee is a planetary scientist at SETI, a director of the Mars Institute, and is a scientist at NASA Ames, just down the road from us in San Francisco. Dr. Lee, how are you today? Oh, have you muted? Sorry about that. <laughs> You're back now. How are you today? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Sorry. Good. How are you doing? Uh, very well. We've got a beautiful view of planet Earth. We've got a really cool program, and we're going to hear all about human exploration out beyond the surface of our own world. So, Mary is our producer today. Can you take us over to our view of Earth in open space? So, we've got a really awesome view. We can see the dark side of our planet where human beings are living, silhouetted against that beautiful star-filled sky. And we are talking today about some of the ideas about humans leaving planet Earth and taking off to see some of these other places. Uh, Pascal, can you tell us about some of the ideas about where human beings might end up next? So we've been to the moon, but we, we haven't been back to the moon with humans for over 50 years now. Uh, and so, well, close to 50 years because the last human landing was in 1972. Uh, so uh, before we launch ourselves onto Mars and to these other great, greater places at greater distances, we, we need to go back to the moon. Uh, the moon, first of all, still has plenty to be discovered uh, about. And then the other thing is uh, it's in the immediate neighborhood of the Earth. And so it's a, it's a good place to practice, to get ready for, for more ambitious exploration activities uh, like what we have in mind for Mars. Now, uh, right now, uh, NASA and uh, hopefully a growing number of international partners are planning to go back to the moon within the next few years uh, and land uh, the first woman and the next uh, man on the moon near the south pole of the moon. And the reason why the polar regions of the moon are interesting uh, is because there is water ice there. And of all the things that are of interest on the moon, water ice is, is super interesting because, well, not only is it a sort of a key ingredient for, for us humans and, and life on Earth, uh, not that we expect any life on the moon, but it's a key ingredient <laughs> for life in general. Uh, it's also something that we can use as rocket fuel by breaking down the H2O into hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, and it's also something that can tell us uh, a lot about the, the origin of the moon and uh, how hot it was when the moon formed. Uh, and right now, the current general idea is that the moon formed by, as a result of the impact of a an object that was about the size of the planet Mars, although there are some variants to this hypothesis, uh, that would have hit that would have hit the proto-Earth. This is uh, when the Earth was slightly smaller than it is today, and some of this material from this uh, impactor, the size of Mars, got incorporated into the Earth, and so the Earth grew to the, its current size. Uh, and then part of the debris that swung around the Earth and and got turned into a, a ring of debris, eventually. Uh, uh, creed it into into uh, our moon and so the moon basically has a very fiery uh, origin in this whole scenario and there are questions about how hot this uh, this disk of gas was and and how much water the moon could have retained from the original body that mm -hmm. that uh, slammed into the the proto earth uh, so the fact that we are finding ice in the polar regions of the moon is really intriguing is this ice sort of strictly a uh, a late addition to the moon from comets that you know hit anywhere on the moon but then the water molecules from the comets get get um, sort of migrate get liberated during the impact and, and migrate over time to to the coldest spots where they condense and, and basically stop migrating so well, that's a process called cold trapping so we think that one scenario is that the lunar polar regions are so cold uh, because there are some places there that never see the, the light of day, they never see the disk of the sun, they're in perpetual darkness. The lunar poles are so cold that you're a little molecule of water bouncing around on the moon wherever you, you were released by, say, a comet impacting the moon, you would eventually make your way to one of these cold traps. Uh, and then once you hit one of these cold traps, well, then now you're trapped because it's so <laughs> cold, you can remain 
as a uh, you sort of keep building up the the ice deposit there and and that's how that's how we think part of the ice in the polar regions of the moon uh, sort of came to be concentrated there but there are other processes there's solar wind hitting the regolith uh forming and releasing some water molecules that have a, sort of a similar fate there are uh there are also other ideas about how the lunar rocks in the first place from the very origin of the moon might still have retained some water uh and we actually know this for a fact now because we've been reanalyzing some of the apollo samples uh i say we not me but uh scientists who are experts at that uh reanalyzing apollo samples and found uh, what you might describe as juvenile water in these rocks in other words water that dates back to the origin of these rocks that were all this time uh trapped inside the moon and now can be sort of uh, extracted from these samples that the apollo astronauts brought back it's strange uh, to so, think of water that old being referred to as juvenile water but i guess yes. that's uh it hasn't been used as much as the rest of the water yeah it's juvenile from the standpoint that's a good point it's juvenile from the standpoint <laughs> of when it got uh sort of uh, incorporated into the moon but there you have it so the lunar polar regions are a strategic location for that reason and this is why we're so focused on trying to get humans not only back to the moon but back to the polar regions where you have these uh once again permanently shadowed regions psrs if you're at a cocktail reception with some lunar scientists and you want to come across as knowing uh what you're talking about you you, you would never say okay it's permanently shadowed region you'd call them psrs okay so, which is different than the your, PSLs we've been hearing about. Okay, so how's your mission <laughs> to the PSR going? Okay, that's uh, planetary scientist talk. Anyway, uh, what I want to talk to you about today, uh, and in fact, I'll be referring to some work that I've been doing with some students as well uh, uh, today, but uh, what I want to talk to you to today is a, sort of an alternate location where we think we might be able to find ice on the moon. And this is really intriguing. So you've You've homed in here on an interesting large impact crater called Philolaus Crater. Uh, it's at 72 degrees north on the moon on the Earth facing side. So, so when you look at the moon, you can actually see Philolaus. We can back and up to give folks a little bit of perspective. If but you were it's got Philolaus, those distinctive yeah. two humps right in the middle, which makes it kind of easy to pick out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for a large crater, that, I mean, for a crater this size, it's about 70 kilometers across. It's actually a relatively recent crater on the moon. It's from the uh, latest geologic era uh, uh, on the moon called the Copernican era, if you care to know. But uh, the point here is that it's a relatively well-preserved, fresh, large crater. And you can see that there's a flat area on the floor of Philolaus. Yeah, right there. And that's uh, an impact melt sheet. The impact that took place whether it was an asteroid or comet we don't know but the impact that took place was so energetic that it literally melted some of the target rocks and the impactor itself probably the impactor itself actually was most likely entirely vaporized in this scenario but but uh the impact melt sheet essentially is made of uh originally of molten target rocks and it's sort of pooled in the bottom of the crater uh, and eventually, uh, once it uh, cooled up, cooled off, uh, turned into this uh, very relatively smooth surface. Well, what's interesting is that this cooling off process was not very uh, sort of sudden. And uh, while some parts were cooling off, other parts were still molten and flowing around, oozing around. And so we ended up having essentially impact melt lava flows uh crisscrossing this impact melt sheet and if i can uh, request some of the pictures that i brought along with you because i'm going to show you uh, what is really intriguing here that we're finding in these in these impact melts okay so on the left you see philolaus crater uh, we're going to zoom in onto the flat area the impact melt sheet as you come in closer each photo is sort of nested from the previous one you come in closer you start seeing some of these uh, collapsed lava tubes, those little gouges that you see crisscrossing the lunar floor there are, are technically known as sinuous rills. In other words, they are essentially depressions that are meandering along the lunar surface. Uh, and these, these meandering little valleys are not really valleys. They are what we think 
there were once uh, lava tubes. In other words, lava flows that were underground with the, the top surface being cool enough to be rigid, but the, mm -hmm. the lava still being hot and molten and flowing underneath. And eventually when the lava flow flowing stopped, the, the over <clears throat> overlying uh, crust uh, would, would collapse. And now you end up with this uh, valley shaped meandering depression uh, called the sinuous rill. So sinuous rills are essentially collapsed lava tubes. Now, if we zoom in closer, let's go to the next slide. You start seeing oh, wow. that some of these sinuous features are not collapsed entirely. They they are in some places uh, marked by actually dotted lines, so to speak. <laughs> okay, so this dotting is really interesting because what we think these are are partially collapsed lava tubes, and therefore you might still have a tunnel or a cave. Uh, underneath there where in those sections where that are not entirely collapsed yet let's zoom in further and then some of these darker spots we think are skylights in other words collapsed little portions of the roof of lava tubes in other words cave entrances to to uh, underground caves on the moon uh, and of course pits and caves have been found on the moon now for mm -hmm. for over a decade we actually know uh, of over 300 uh, pits and caves uh, on the moon, but most of the ones that have been found, and this is largely the work of uh, Mark Robinson and Robert Wagner, but also from the, the Kaguya team in Japan, uh, most of these, these pits and caves that have been reported so far are at low latitudes. And these caves that are at low latitudes are gonna be too hot, we think, to cold trap any water ice because sunlight will sort of shine down into the pit and will warm up the rocks at the bottom of the pit and the rocks will radiate their heat into the cave. And so you end up at low latitudes with caves that are still interesting to explore, but that are not gonna be cold. What's interesting here at Philolaus is that if these little things that I'm po pointing out here are confirmed to be skylights or so cave entrances, mm -hmm. then you are dealing with caves in which sunlight never enters. The sunlight is so grazing near the North Pole of the Moon here where we are. We are only 500 kilometers from the North Pole of the Moon. Uh, the sunlight is so grazing uh, year round that it never hits the bottom of the pit. And therefore the rocks at the bottom of this pit never get heated. Therefore these caves are super cold. In fact, they are as cold as the PSRs in the lunar polar regions. And so now all of a sudden we have a, a, a sort of a different setting in which we might be able to find water ice cold trapped on the moon. Of course, we don't know this. This is pure conjecture, uh, but it's really exciting intriguing. Exciting possibility though, for sure. It's an exciting possibility because now you're, you're talking about finding ice in an environment that would be sheltered from radiation and micrometeoric bombardment. And, um, you know, Philolaus Crater is approximately well, it's less than a billion years old or so. I um, mean, Copernican age terrain on the moon are, are 1.1 billion years old or less. So it's a, you know, it's, it doesn't take us back to the origin of the moon, but uh, it could still be very ancient water uh, if there's any trapped inside these lava tubes. And the water could be coming from outside, but it could also be water from the final cooling of this impact melt sheet. Uh, if if uh, if some water was mobilized by by the molten rocks. Anyway, mm -hmm. the bottom line is this: there are some there are caves all over the moon, but my favorites are are these intriguing candidate caves near the North Pole of the Moon. Uh, I reported these about uh, two years ago now, uh, but this summer with um, a new student, um, Winnie Avent the second. Uh, with Winnie, we mapped out more of these candidate pits inside Philolaus, and we found some new ones uh, in a nearby crater uh, called Anaxagoras. But before we go there, let me show you the next few slides real quick. There you go. The, the, this is some of the best images that we have of the pits inside Philolaus. Oh, wow. So sunlight is coming from... Don't be tricked by the lighting, okay? Sunlight is coming from the bottom of the image here, okay? And what's really intriguing is the brightening that you see right on the top part of each pit, okay? Because 
that's indicative of a funnel, but also of the possible vertical wall that is slightly lit by the sunlight, uh, but not all the way into the cave. Okay, so we're very intrigued by this. And there are tens of them, uh, at, at the very least, that we have, you know, that we think are reasonable candidates inside Philo uh, impact melt sheet. Uh, next slide is showing you sort of the, what this might look like in section, okay. So the light grace there, there is the impact belt sheet surface at the top on the surface of the moon. Sunlight is coming in at an angle. You can see the sunlight can hit part of the vertical wall of the pit, of the skylight pit, but does not hit the floor of the, of the cave. You have a lava tube underneath. <clears throat> and right underneath the pit, uh, the environment is such that temperatures could be as cold as in the PSRs and the polar regions. And you wow. might actually have a, a, a deposit of ice. So we did a bit of math on this, uh, you know, some back of the envelope uh, modeling. And if you have a, a layer of, say, one meter of water ice accumulated there at the bottom of this 30-meter uh, pit, uh, or 15-meter pit, actually, in this case, uh, you would end up with something like seven metric tons of water ice that's ready for you. Yeah, that's, well, that will fill several... Uh, Luna landers. Uh, so <laughs> now we cool. noticed you had that little portrayal of human beings down there. And I've heard these things put forward as like science fiction ideas of where human beings might live. I feel like you'd have a hard time convincing people to go live in a lava tube that hasn't collapsed yet. Like that sounds like a pretty scary yeah, environment I, just because rock would fall on you. I uh, That's a good point, Josh. I'm attracted to lava tubes, but to explore them, not not to live in them. <laughs> uh, lava tubes on the earth are, are not like your regular caves. I mean, human beings have used caves for a long, long time to, you know, as shelters, but most of them are in karst, in other words, in limestone and dolomite, uh, not, uh, not in, um, <clears throat> lava tubes have been much more rarely used as dwellings, uh, especially for long, any long-term dwelling. Of course, there's plenty of short-term dwelling, uh, uses of lava tubes, but not for the long-term because they're very harsh environments. And on the earth, it turns out they are always very far from liquid water as well. Mm. Uh, unlike limestone caves, which almost by definition are near liquid water. Uh, so anyway, uh, caves are prone to collapse. Yeah. Yeah, they can it's be scary. And this is Anaxagoras, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the other Copernican age, large crater, Anaxagoras, not too far from mm -hmm. uh, Philo Laos and actually uh, close to the central meridian. You can see Phil Laos the right Earth. there. Yeah, exactly. And Anaxagoras uh, has some candidate pits as well, found by uh, student uh, Winnie Avent II, and I'm very proud of, of that work. It's, uh, it's exciting. So uh, who knows? We, we might want to send some robotic uh, precursors into these regions first to make sure they are pits to begin with and caves, uh, but then humans could eventually follow up. Nobody's advocating that humans go into caves up front, uh, but it's something to bear in mind because water is everything on the moon and uh, almost. And as much effort as we're putting into going to the permanently shadow regions of the poles, we should we should also not forget that there are also caves that could that could that could harbor water, water ice. Well, it sounds like we are exciting environments, not just on our moon, but we wanted to take folks a little farther out. Can you tell us about our next destination? Next stop, Mars. <laughs> so Mars, of course, is uh, what I dream about uh, and where, where many people, of course, want to go and send humans. Mars is so exciting, so interesting. Incidentally, you know, as much as I'm also, I'm, I wasn't so hot on settling lava tubes on the moon, I'm not big on colonizing Mars either. Uh, however, I'm very big on exploring Mars. I want humans to go there to, to check out the place, really, and to explore it in depth. Uh, colonizing is, first of all, it's going to be somebody else's problem, but, <laughs> but uh, to me, it's less attractive as a proposition as much as sort of moving on to the next place after that to, to explore. Mm -hmm. But Mars is planning to explore, and so let's talk about this. Something historic happened uh, just a few years ago. In 2015, NASA, and in particular, um, uh, well, NASA convened the first international conference on 
uh, human landing sites and exploration zones on Mars. This, this is really historic because for the first time, uh, NASA sort of brought together the community of scientists and engineers who were uh, potentially interested in proposing landing sites for humans to start uh, planning where we might go to on Mars if you know when when the time comes. And it, it's a big step. You know, imagine. It, it happened for Apollo when we decided to go to the moon. All of a sudden, we had we had workshops and teams of people coming together to propose landing sites for astronauts. Uh, when you start thinking of a landing site for humans on Mars, that's when things are getting serious. Mm -hmm. So things started getting serious in 2015, and uh, uh, maybe I can show some of the slides that I've um, set aside for this. Certainly. Uh, yep. So here's the map compiled by NASA of the. 47 or so, I think uh, 47 or so landing sites and slash exploration zones. So a landing site is sort of a spot that's a few kilometers across where you would actually land all your assets. And then the exploration zone is the 100 kilometer uh, circle, so to speak, uh, that goes around each landing site. Okay, so we were to propose uh, these landing sites and here they are. Here they are mapped out. So they're all over the place, all over the map. And the one I'm going to talk to you about, the one that I'm strongly biased uh, in favor of, is the one that is near the triplet of volcanoes uh, in the Western Hemisphere there uh, on, your, on the left side of the map called Noctis Landing. Okay. But uh, let's, let's go to the next slide. So this is actually showing you the constraints we were put under to propose these landing sites. First of all, they could not be too far north or too far south. And that's why the high latitudes are, are shaded, uh, because at the latitudes, it's essentially too cold. Uh, and there's also not enough uh, solar power in the winter to keep things warm. Uh, so those places are too cold, too challenging for electronics in general to go explore. Uh, and so we need to avoid these these dark bands. So as much as a land, you know, landing at a polar region on the polar cap would be sort of exciting conceptually, um, it's it's not in the cards for for now. Also, what's grayed out at lower latitudes are the high altitude areas. See, there's a giant patch on the left. That's the Tharsis bulge, it's sort of the um, uplifted crustal. Uh, Part of Mars's Mars's crust that's that carries most of, most of its giant volcanoes. Uh, that's the Tharsis bulge on the left, uh, and then some of the highlands uh, of Mars in the rest uh, of the lower latitude regions are also too high in altitude for, for you to land. But everything else was fair game. Everything that's blue, green, yellow, orange, that is fair game to land. And just to put the site that we picked in context, the site that we picked is that little tip at the western end of this gigantic scar, this canyon, Dallas Marineris, that cuts through and into the Tharsis Bulge. You can see that there is a blue and green giant scar, that's the Dallas Marineris Canyon, cutting into see the volcanic that? region. And right at the very, up here. Yeah. At the, at, the most, at the leftmost tip of it, there's a little spot that's almost too high in altitude, but it's yellow still, and that's Noctis Landing. Okay, and uh, this, the reason why we like Noctis is sort of illustrated right here already, because it, it takes you to the heart of the volcanic region of Mars, where you might still have warmth, still have volcanic activities, still have options for finding extant life on Mars, life that would be alive today. So you need some warmth, you need availability of liquid water. Uh, so going to the long-term volcanic region of Mars is is not a bad idea. It's sort of a good uh, strategy. And then you are also uh, able to access Valles Marineris, which is this gigantic five-mile deep road cut uh, that exists in the crust of Mars, which gives you so many options to explore Mars through time and look for fossil life in the geologic record of Mars. Uh, so this is why we love this location so much. It gives you access to the most distant geologic history of Mars, 
and the possibility of, for looking for fossil life and options to go search for extant life uh, in associated with the volcanoes of Mars, which might still be active. Next slide. Now, there you go. This is where Noctis Landing is. So I've been working on Noctis Landing with a few students uh, over the past uh, few summers. First of all, this uh, this view shows, let's talk about this, what we see here first. Uh, Noctis Landing there is that little yellow dot. It's a flat, uh, relatively boring spot in itself. <laughs> um, it's Good surrounded for landing, by not for science. You want flat for, spots, I guess. Landing. Good for calms. You you want to you don't want to be you know on the floor of a canyon mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the base of a wall, and then you can't see the earth most of the time. You have to have a good view to the to the north and the south. Uh, we are at about seven degrees latitude south here, uh, and the primary exploration zone would give you access to Noctis Labyrinthus on in the west, the canyons to the la to the, in the east, Udaman's crater. I'll talk about that in a second to the south, uh, and then get to the volcanoes it's a bit of a longer drive we'll touch on that as well but uh, here you are uh, at a very interesting place that's uh, a basin of mysterious origin incidentally you don't see a clear impact crater origin to this spot uh, and yet it's a low spot in a relative sense uh, so so we're very intrigued by this landing site and then with a secondary exploration zone that extends out to 200 kilometers, you can see that we could explore a lot of terrain going deep into the canyons to the, to the east as well. All right, next slide. So Udaman's crater is super exciting. Uh, in fact, if we don't, if, sorry, maybe we go back to the previous slide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a lot of people propose going to Valles Marineris squarely, like, you know, uh, they, they, you want to be where the geology is exposed, so let's land on the floor of the canyon, and then you, you are right there with the geology all beautifully preserved in the canyon walls right, right next to you. But the canyon walls are not next to you. They are above you. And that's a real problem because if you land in a location where you see all the geology from far away, but you really can't get to it because it's, it's on a cliff, uh, and you know it would be really difficult to go explore and, and, and sample, uh, uh, you, you are you don't really get the full advantage of really being in a place where you have all this ancient geology exposed if you can't really sample it methodically. Sure, you can sift through the rubble at the bottom of the canyon uh, and figure out which rock came from which layer, but good luck with that. Uh, it's <laughs> it's going to be really tough. Okay, But the beauty here is that Udaman's crater, which you see near Noctis Landing. Right down there at the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Udaman's crater is recent enough and big enough that what it did was it basically broke up huge chunks of the walls of that are exposed in Valles Marineris. And these gigantic slabs of canyon walls are now lying horizontally, but still organized layer by layer on the floor uh, near the center and around Udaman's. Okay. So if I could go to my next slide, which is this. What you're seeing here, okay, each strip is about uh, uh, a couple of kilometers wide, okay. What you're seeing here are all these beautiful layers of the Valles Marineris canyon walls now laying flat on the ground, okay, one big chunk at a time, but then that's a lot more manageable. And now you can drive, you can walk from one layer to another while wow. they're resting horizontally. So the art of doing field geology is to go into places where not things are not just visible, but accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, so so now you, uh, you can be walking around uh, and driving to each from one layer to another, sampling it, knowing which layer is older than which other. You can do all your detailed uh, fossil searching and environmental characterization uh, because the layering is so well preserved uh there so so the impact crater had the benefit of basically breaking things up and putting them flat laying them flat for you but uh but at the same time not completely destroying the geologic record that was there okay, so that's the that's the big advantage here of Udan's crater uh, so that's about looking for ancient life on mars mm -hmm. uh, next slide next slide we we look at how we might go to the volcanoes okay so so now it's a longer drive to get to the volcanoes themselves but over time we will be able to do this uh, 
I did a traverse in the Arctic with a Humvee on sea ice on unprepared terrain. Uh, and we essentially were able to show that uh, you can you can reasonably do a hundred kilometers per day uh, wow. on terrain that is you know relatively trafficable if you have a, a good rover. Uh, so, so this is essentially rocky terrain with ups and downs and hummocks to cross and you know I mean 100 kilometers a day that's sort of an average. Some days we we did less, some days we did more, but Still 100 kilometers like a, a day lot. is sort of it seems like a lot, but. But now, bear in mind, you're not doing this necessarily all in one go. You sort of mm -hmm. go by known route. So you establish a route to a point that's 100 kilometers away first, and then the next mission maybe does pushes the 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 uh, the edge to another 200 kilometers beyond, or something like that. And so over time, you you build up essentially roads, known paths that you can reliably traverse. Uh, and then these volcanoes become accessible within a week or two weeks of driving. Wow. And that is super exciting because the volcanoes, once again, could still be active. Uh, we, we don't know. First of all, there's no sign of volcanic activity on Mars, just to be clear right now. We, we've been looking for fumaroles and hot mm -hmm. spots and nothing so far. But some of these volcanoes are so big that... They, they must have been active for at least 2 billion years, some of them. And 2 billion years, that's half of Mars's history. So sure. chances for them, for them being still somehow active today are, are not small. It's sort of reasonable. Some of the most, some of the youngest lava flows that we know of on, on Mars are believed to be, you know, maybe 10 million years old. Some people claim even less. Okay. So that's very, that's yesterday, basically, in terms of, uh, geologic history and therefore uh, Martian volcanoes might be dormant but they could still be active uh, they, they you know some might be extinct of course but some might just be dormant in any case we are very excited by the volcanoes because again there are caves associated with them next slide so, so here you are this is one of my favorite pits on the Arcia Mons, actually at the base of Arcia Mons on Mars. Uh, well, actually on the sort of rise associated with Arcia Mons. Uh, this pit is called the Jean Pit. It's about 150 meters across. Uh, it is bottomless in the sense that <laughs> we've uh, looked at this pit. It's We've looked at this pit with different lighting geometries and stretched the images to death. Uh, in m many pits, you can you can at that point see the floor of the pit, mm -hmm. but in this case, in this in, for this particular one, we can't. It pitch black, no matter how you stretch the images. So so the estimate here is that it's at least 170 meters, if I remember well, uh, deep. Okay, uh, so so that's astounding because. Well, it's you know it's a big it's, hole. It's a huge cavity that's underneath. It's a huge cavity. Okay, and so what I have on the right here is a painting depicting, you know, of course, a scene far in the future where astronauts are going into this cave and are finding somehow uh, uh, I'm just struck by doing light. exactly what that person's doing on Earth without a spacesuit would be incredibly difficult and dangerous. Doing it on Earth in a spacesuit would be difficult and dangerous. Doing it on Mars in a spacesuit sounds horrifying. So kudos to that artist for imagining humans yeah. that brave. Well, on a, uh, <laughs> well, actually, I'll take credit for that. But <laughs> hey, uh, humans exploring caves like this, hu humans exploring caves like this is actually not that extraordinary on Earth. I mean, you know, spelunkers do incredible things. Uh, rappelling down into a sort of a lava tube skylight pit, uh, even some that are, you know, tens of meters deep, it are things that you know cavers do i would say almost commonly i mean it's 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 not even newsworthy is my point uh it's you know again we're not ready for this on mars yet okay just to be clear but it's something to aim for down the road and of course before we send humans we will scout these places out with drones maybe mm -hmm. um there's a helicopter that's going to mars now with perseverance so the problem with these pits, of course, in caves are they're at high altitude. They're on the flanks of these giant volcanoes, so drones can't fly anymore. Uh, you can't, right. you cannot really use rotor. Not enough air to point. push against. 
exactly not enough uh, air density so so you would have to you know use maybe a thrust a gas thrusted drone you know like a little rock drone with little rocket engines but um anyway that's one way of doing it another concept is something i'm working on with jpl called globetrotter which is essentially a uh, a balloon, a, a little spacecraft surrounded by by a cage, and it, it essentially bounces. Doesn't care what it hits and where it lands. So you could just throw this off the edge; it, it would drop down into the cave, bounce, just like an airbag landing on Mars. And then once it uh, comes to rest, it would study its surroundings, take pictures, flash photography, of course, uh, and then and then fly back out because it's a. It has these little thrusters on it. So anyway, that's the globe trotter concept. I am. Bottom always... line here is. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just I'm say, all... Josh. Uh, the bottom line here is there's plenty to explore on Mars and lots of exciting things for humans to do. And uh, Noctis Landing is one place that I find particularly exciting. I have a. St I'm working with a student in India called Surab uh, Shubham. He is helping us map the mineralogy uh, on the floor of uh, this area around Noctis Landing. We're finding some really interesting water-related uh, minerals and deposits, which means that this is a place where we could probably extract water easily from some of the minerals that are there. Uh, with another student I've worked on extracting water from the atmosphere of Mars in that location. People have now ruled out extracting water from just compressing the Martian atmosphere because the, the uh, the compression ratios are too high and the water content in the Martian atmosphere is too low, but that's on average Martian atmospheric content. If you look at this particular location, uh, the one of the first slides I that Mary showed here earlier today uh, shows you fog filling these canyon floors mm -hmm. frequently. And when you have fog, the water concentration in the atmosphere can be about an order of magnitude higher than it is elsewhere on average on Mars. So before so we that flew away, that, though, I wanted to show yeah. folks one last really cool detail we can see. If I get close enough and there's a fine balance, you can see some features on some of these, which is like sand dune variation. Now, I don't know that that's actual sand dune accumulating on the surface, but oh, anytime yeah. you see sand. a detail Plenty like that, yeah. it's beautiful. And if folks yeah. want to check this out and visit some of the places yeah. that Pascal has shown us, Download open space, try it out. You can go from where you see sand dunes to where you see the entirety of uh, Valles Marineris. And that kind of ability to fly around Mars is something really special. And with some context becomes a really amazing adventure for you to take yourself on. But we have some other places we want to hit before our program winds down. So I was going to introduce yeah. the outer part of our solar system and head a bit yes. farther out. Yeah, we're heading to Titan yeah, so next, Mars I believe. Too, and then we... That's right, Titan. I think it's uh, you know now that Mars is sort of squarely on the map of where we plan to go, uh, you know what could lie beyond. And I think beyond, um, I don't think Venus is a you know will ever be a good place to send people. Pretty tough for humans, unless you're into sort of cities in the cloud type of thing. Uh, but. Um, uh, Titan, Titan is, I think, really an exciting place, and let's let's go see why. Oop. Let me see if I can get Titan to show up. So Titan is one of the largest moons in the solar system, and Titan and Saturn's largest moon. Okay, Titan, but it's it, I almost think of Titan as an exoplanet in the sense that okay, it's really far away, but it's sort of a, like a Earth relevant world. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, it has a solid surface. It has a thick atmosphere. In fact, it's one of the only moons that has a thick atmosphere. And it's astoundingly thick because it's thicker than the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, Titan has a surface atmospheric pressure of 1.45 atmospheres, one and a half atmospheres. So it's That's one incredible. and a half times denser yeah, uh, at the surface of um, – sorry, the atmosphere is, is has a pressure that's one and a half times what it is at the surface of the Earth. So – and the atmosphere is made of mostly nitrogen. Okay, 95% of it is is 98% uh, of it is nitrogen uh, on Titan. Uh, and uh, sorry, 95% of it is, is nitrogen. And then you have a methane as a secondary component, which of course is a toxic gas for us, but it's a it's a it's, a, it's an organic gas. So Titan, of course, is this incredible world where we hope to. Uh, 
be able to study prebiotic chemistry, the early phases of organic chemistry that led to the origins of life on Earth. And of course, NASA is planning to, to send this uh, incredible dragonfly drone mission to, to Titan. And it, indeed, it's a great idea to fly in such a th you know, thick atmosphere. Uh, and the gravity is low as well, so mm -hmm. your flying is very efficient on Titan. The gravity on Titan is even lower than, than on the moon. Uh, the moon's gravity is, you know, 17% of what it is on the Earth. Titan's gravity is 14% of what it is on the Earth. Uh, but what is incredible with this thick atmospheric pressure is that that opens the door for humans to possibly explore Titan one day, okay? Uh, because now what you need on Titan is to just protect yourself from the methane, I guess, in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. because that's really a lot. And you need to still have an oxygen supply but you don't need a pressure suit anymore. You do not need a pressure suit. Let me repeat that. You do not need a pressure suit. You don't have to be and you know, sort of ensconced in this uh, rigid, pressurized bladder that a space suit it normally is. Uh, a Titan suit just has to keep you warm and insulated from the toxic gases that are outside. Warm sounds and really important. You certainly have to be kept warm. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because the temperature the temperature at the surface of Titan is 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 uh, minus 180 degrees C, so that's 94 Kelvin. Uh, not I warm. I have no idea what that is in Fahrenheit. We say about negative it's 300 not warm, Fahrenheit. Like, okay, all right, there you go. So you need more than a parka. Uh, <laughs> you need uh, you know some really good insulating uh, equipment. You know, a head mask to breathe oxygen. Uh, and I am also working with a student this summer. In fact, it's a high school student uh, who's helping us uh, with the, the design of a spacesuit for, for Titan. Okay, so we haven't published that yet, but once it's ready, we will get that out. The student is Joe Nadiju. He lives in the Bay Area. And uh, anyway, I think he'll forgive Are me for had... mentioning his name. He's still in high school. <laughs> We had, I and, think, a really uh, yeah. cool shot of Titan's surface because what we're showing folks is actually a map of infrared mapping done from above. But yeah, can you tell us a little bit about what yeah. we're seeing in this picture? Yeah, so this is a an actual image of Titan during descent of the Huygens probe as it was about to land. It took this aerial view of Titan as it was sinking through the haze, the organic haze of Titan's surface. Uh, so this is from the European Space Agency. It's an image processed by um, uh, somebody who has my last name. I mean, Pascal is his last name, actually, but uh, uh, no relation. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful uh, scene that shows you what it's like to sort of descend uh, you know, to the surface and of Titan. And this, this picture is... Yeah, go ahead, oh, Josh. The next picture. Uh, this would be more like the colors our eyes would see should we be there, not so much gray and black That's like correct. our imagery. That's correct. But once you get underneath this haze, it gets quite a bit darker okay? because the surface you can tell is dark. Mm -hmm. And so this bright uh, scattering that you see at the surface is something that you would see at high altitude. But once you are on the surface of, of Titan, the, the skies become quite a bit darker. Next slide. Oh, that's beautiful. Seeing yeah. Saturn kind of on yeah, the so limb. That's, yeah, that's right. So that's that's actually a painting I did of what Saturn might look like from the surface of Titan, where there are actually lakes of methane, liquid methane, and ethane. Uh, so, you know, it's a it's it's a carcinogenic <laughs> that is at the surface, but it's still very beautiful. Uh, mm -hmm. You can sort of see the carcinog carcinogens. Uh, and actually, it's not even clear if the atmosphere of Titan ever breaks up enough for you to see the disk of Saturn. But painting Saturn from Titan is such an iconic uh, sort of uh, perspective mm -hmm. in uh, the history of uh, space art that I had to ch try my hand at it. But by, by just allowing Titan Saturn to be seen fleetingly, you know, in a, in a brief break, in the haze, in the toxic haze of, of Titan's surface. Okay, but so here you can tell uh, from the picture, since the rings of Saturn are vertical almost, that you are near the equator of Titan. Okay? So Titan always shows the same face to to Saturn. It's 
synchronous rotation, just like our moon is. Uh, and so here we are, you know, somewhere on the leading hemisphere of, uh, of Titan. Uh, next slide. That's a great one. This must be from the lander. Yeah, this is actually from the pod, the capsule that landed Huygens, the Huygens probe from the European Space Agency that was carried to Saturn by NASA's Cassini orbiter. Uh, so the Huygens probe landed and, you know, with this is, of course, an enhanced image, but it landed on this boulder field. And what's amazing to realize is that these boulders are made of water ice, most of them at least. Uh, and so you're looking at a world that is so cold that rock is literally uh, uh, the, the main rock that is at the surface of this world. Uh, and so there you go. <laughs> Boulders of ice coated with organic goop. So here we uh, are looking from Titan so towards Saturn. So I think we need to wrap up, right? We're getting pretty close, but yeah. I think we got time for our one last view of kind of the macro scale. Yeah, so you know why why do we bother to do all this? And I, I think I think of course it's because I mean for me personally it's it's the science, it's the search for life in any form. Uh, but what's important to realize is that what we are searching for is an example of alien life. We we realize that just finding life on Mars is is not necessarily the uh, everything. What you what you really care about in this whole process is to try to find an example, a first example of an alien life form. So, you know, even if we were to discover life, a sign of life on Mars today in a fossil form, I'd be happy and you know, excited, but it wouldn't tell us really what it is because it could be just Earth life exported to Mars. Or we ourselves, in some more extreme scenario, could be Mars life exported to the Earth, you know, a long time ago, and then we took off from there. Uh, I mean, those planets are not isolated. Mars has meteorites that have landed there that have come from Earth, vice versa. We have meteorites that have come from Mars. Planets are not isolated systems. Life could have been transferred from one planet to another. And so finding life per se on Mars uh, won't tell us necessarily a lot about how universal life as a process is in the universe. And, you know, even if we found this weird fossil on Mars, we wouldn't be able to tell for sure that it's alien life, uh, which is why I think it's so important that we focus on trying to find living life on Mars, extent life, because if you find extent life, you can then do genetics on it. And, and then you can determine genetically whether it has anything to do with Earth life or not. Okay. And if it was to be found to be genetically really different from Earth life, you can only do genetics on something that's, that's still alive or, or has been dead for not a long time. Mm -hmm. um, it's only if you can establish that it's genetically radically different from Earth life, which has a lot of commonalities genetically, uh, that you could you could conclude that it's really alien life. Okay. So an entirely different approach, of course, to searching for alien life is to try to find signs of alien intelligence out there. And uh, you know we can squabble about what we mean by intelligence, and you know whether or not we ourselves are intelligent or not. <laughs> That's, that's all fun to, to argue. In fact, Carl Sagan used to say that the, the, the surest sign that there is intelligence out there is that they haven't tried to contact us. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, the, the thing about intelligence is that uh, we have to realize how extraordinary it was as, a, as, a, as, an, as an event on the Earth. Okay? Uh, from the standpoint of intelligence reaching the point where it can come up with Maxwell's equations, build radio telescopes, and become a technologically communicating civilization, all right? So never before us humans did that ever happen, or it was even close to happen in the history of the Earth, as far as we can tell, you know, for four and a half billion years. Life on Earth appeared very early. Mm -hmm. Like as soon as we had liquid water stable on the surface of the Earth, life started to emerge in those waters. We have fossils that date back pretty much to to the, the early youth of the Earth. Okay. Uh, but intelligent life took its sweet time and in fact wasn't even necessary, you know, didn't even didn't even happen as a necessity, it seems, but more as a happenstance uh, adaptation. So the here's the thing. We we are of course wanting to have our 
have an open mind on this. We're looking for extraterrestrial intelligence in, in space. Uh, and I'm going to give a talk actually next month as part of Wonderfest and the Bay Area Science Festival about this in, in more detail. But uh, I've been uh, basically trying to make the case that if you actually look at the numbers, and there's an equation that helps us organize these numbers, which is called the Drake equation. The Drake equation gives you the number N, capital N, of advanced civilizations in the galaxy right now uh, by as a, as a multiplication of seven terms. It's the rate of star formation in our galaxy times the fraction of those stars that have planets times the fraction of those planets that have an environment suitable for life uh, in that planetary system times the, the fraction of planets on which life actually emerges, times the fraction of those planets where life becomes intelligent, times the fraction of those planets where intelligent life becomes capable of technological communication, times the average longevity of a civilization in our galaxy. So if you knew the exact value of each term, you would have the number N of advanced civilizations in our galaxy. We Let me say immediately that we don't know the yeah. exact number <laughs> of each one which is sort of the problem and at the same time the opportunity but uh if you plug in the numbers that we know from the earth bearing in mind that it's a unique example it's a unique data point it has therefore it's very flawed as a data set sure because it's a single data point data set uh but if you plug in the numbers that we learn from the earth uh, the the real showstopper is how long it took intelligence to emerge on Earth. Okay. It, life itself appeared quickly. Intelligent life took four and a half billion years. Uh, in fact, it's too the, the you, you can you can come up with a way to estimate what that means in terms of the probability of intelligence emerging. But basically, it's going to bring down the number n dramatically to the point where n is turns out to be roughly one, give or take. The give or take is very important because there are huge errors. So we should still search for intelligent life in our galaxy. We should still be listening. But what this tells us is that our expectations should be low because the number N of advanced civilizations in our galaxy, uh, if the Earth is representative at all of all the processes and steps that, it, that need to be taken for intelligence to, to emerge and a communicating society to, to appear, uh, the number of civilizations or galaxies is very low, of order one. So we are it, or there might be another one out there. And if it's sort of randomly placed, we have a galaxy that's about 100,000 light years across. The other one might be, I don't know, on average 50,000 light years away. Uh, that's, a, that's a great distance away for all intended purposes. We'd be uh, essentially alone. So I'll flesh all this out in my talk uh, next month. But... Um, you know, I think we, we, had we basically couple, might be living in this. We had a couple questions yeah, pop I was just up to say you a moment to field some. Yeah. Why don't we do that? Why don't we do so that? So we had a question coming in from Corey. Okay, so, Can you tell us more about how you got into science and your fields of study today? Yeah, I, I've always been interested in science and engineering. I, I credit television for that. Uh, science fiction, television, Star Trek, Lost in Space, Thunderbirds. <laughs> TV series that got me interested in science and technology. But then uh, the moon landing, the moon landing was a, a big thing that I was just barely old enough to to witness and, and be in awe of. And then I let, read Carl Sagan's Cosmic Connection when I was a teenager, a young teenager, an early teenager. And that book really made me decide to become a planetary scientist. This was wow. the book he wrote before he became world famous with Cosmos. Uh, it's called The Cosmic Connection, and I would recommend that reading uh, to anybody. But anyway, that's the book that made me want to become you know, uh, a planetary scientist. And then from then on, I studied geology uh, first, studied the Earth. And after that, I, I uh, actually had to spend a year in Antarctica, so I went for, for a year. Uh, and then I went to grad school again uh, to study astronomy. And I was actually lucky to be... Uh, Joe Viverka's last graduate student at, at Cornell and, and Carl Sagan's last TA at, uh, at Cornell. Uh, so I studied planetary science uh, and then 
and then I started working after that. So in terms of what I study, I study mostly Mars, but also the moon as a stepping stone to Mars. And I'm also interested in where we go from there, which is, I think, Titan beyond that. So lately I've started working on, on Titan a little bit as well with, with, with different students. Some pretty fascinating stuff. Another question, I hear lots of talk about Mars, Europa, for places where there could be life, but not the moon. Is it possible that microbial life could be found in those sheltered caves? Like, is the moon still a place we are looking for life? Well, we're, we're not expecting to find uh, life in on the moon. Uh, well, first of all, there is life on the moon because we, we brought, we landed stuff on the moon that wasn't sterilized. Uh, and so, and we've crashed things that apparently carried tardigrades. So there is uh -huh. life on the moon. I have news for everybody. There is life on the moon. <laughs> and when the Apollo 12 astronauts brought back a camera, the Survey 3 lander, there, there were bugs from the Earth that were still alive. So we, we think that there's at least Earth life somehow in stasis on the moon. They're not happy. They, they're missing liquid water really badly. Uh, so they're not you know metabolizing or anything. But they, 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 there could be Earth life already there on the moon that, will, that was brought in by us. Now, as far as alien life, thriving on the moon we don't anticipate that that's that's a possibility because you, you need more than just ice or water you, you need liquid water all earth life needs liquid water and i don't think it's a it's a earth life centric argument uh, liquid water is chemically you know a very important thing it's it's a, it's a neutral solution that allows chemical exchanges to take place in a neutral environment um and so if you don't have an environment that allows you to have liquid water, then you are, you know, you're not in very good shape. But uh, so there's no expectation to find any form of alien biome uh, on the moon, whether you are in the permanently shadowed regions or not. Okay. But we still have to protect these places. Uh, and um, there you have it. I think we have time for one more question. Let's see. We had a cool one come up about spacesuits. So, are you still involved in testing spacesuits? You were mentioned yeah. in the conversation with Andy Weir of Martian fame. You mentioned wearing them and see how well they hold up here on planet Earth. Yeah, yeah. No, we are involved in testing space. In fact, we could not go to the Arctic this summer, where we go every summer to do some spacesuit testing, among other things, uh, because of COVID. But we have a plan B, so we're going to deploy to a closer location that uh, I'm not prepared to disclose yet. <laughs> uh, we, we have a deployment in the works uh, for October uh, and uh, where we will be testing a, a new spacesuit and all of this in preparation for the moon. Uh, so, yes, you know, spacesuits are are not just clothing, right? They are wearable spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And, and in fact, it's sort of the minimalist approach to me. The spacesuit is sort of the greatest tool that you can give a, a geologist <laughs> to allow her or him to, you know, explore the surface of the moon or Mars. It's a it's a it's a real gift. It's a it's a it's a research tool. Uh, you know, in addition to being a wearable spacecraft and a it's and, probably and pretty good COVID protection if you never take it off. But that doesn't seem like an efficient use. Yes. Uh, you got a unless it's shout inside. Out from yes. Saurabh saying thanks for mentioning oh, and a bunch of other Surab accolades. From India, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. Saurabh is a very bright student in Karakpur, India. Hi, Saurabh. We, we are elated to have you watching. But thank you, Pascal, Dr. Lee, for giving us this insight into all the cool things that are happening with human exploration beyond Earth. Any parting words for our audience? No, it's an exciting place out there. You know, we should go explore. And one we may have had your audio drop out momentarily, but we'll see if you come back. But I would like to thank all of you for joining us here for our broadcast. It has been a joy bringing you some of the insight on where human beings might be ending up in the not too distant future. From myself, from Dr. Lee, from Morrison Planetarium, thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Lee. It is a joy. Okay, have a wonderful rest of your day, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.